Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Welcome back, we're here at theCUBE at Spark Summit 2017. I'm David Goad, here with uh, George Gilbert. George? Good to be Thanks here. Thanks for hanging with us. Well, here's the other man of the hour here. Uh, we just talked with Ali, uh, the CEO at Databricks, and now we have the chief architect and co-founder at Databricks, Reynold Shin. Reynold, Hi, how are you? Hi, George. I'm um, good, how are you doing? Awesome, are you enjoying good. yourself here at the show? Absolutely, it's a fantastic, it's the largest summit, um, it's a lot of interesting things, a lot of interesting people to uh, meet. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I know you're a really humble guy, but I had to ask Ali, you know, what should I ask <laughs> Reynold when he get up here? He said, well, Reynold's one of the biggest contributors to Spark, and uh, yes. you've been with us for a long time, right? Uh, yes, yeah, I've yeah. uh, been contributing for Spark um, for about five or six years, and uh, I guess, yeah, has probably the most number of commits um, to the project, and uh, lately more, I'm working with other people to help um, design the roadmap for both Spark and Databricks uh, on time. Okay. Well, let's get started talking about some of the new developments that you want, maybe our audience uh, on theCUBE hasn't heard here in the, in the keynote this morning. Sure. Yeah. What are some of the, the ex most exciting new developments? So, I think in general, if you look at Spark, there are um, three directions I would say we're doubling down. Um, one, the first direction is the uh, deep learning. Like, deep learning is extremely hot and um, it, it's very capable, but as um, we alluded to earlier in uh, a blog post, um, I think deep learning has reached sort of a MapReduce point in which it has shown its tremendous potential, but the tools are very difficult to use. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping to sort of democratize deep learning and do it spark what Spark did to big data, to deep learning, um, mm -hmm. with this new library called Deep Learning Pipelines. So what it does, it integrates uh, deep learning, um, different deep learning libraries directly in Spark and can actually expose models um, in SQL, so even the business analysts are capable of leveraging that. So that's mm -hmm. one area, deep learning. The second area is streaming. Um, streaming's again, um, I think there's a lot of us, um, customers have aspirations to actually uh, shorten the latency and increase the throughput in um, streaming. So we just actually measure um, the, well, um, the structure of streaming effort is going to uh, mm -hmm. be generally available. And last month alone on Databricks platform, I think um, our customers processed three trillion records last month wow. alone using structured streaming. And we also have a new effort to actually uh, push down the latency all the way down mm -hmm. to a sub-millisecond range. So you can really do blazing fa blazingly fast um, streaming analytics. Mm -hmm. And last but not least is the SQL data warehousing area. Um, data warehousing, I think there's, um, it, it's a very mature area from a sort of outside of big data point of view, but mm -hmm. from a big data one, um, it's still pretty new, and there's a lot of, um, I would say, um, use cases that's popping up there. And Spark, with the pushes mm -hmm. like the CBO, and also in particular in the Databricks runtime, um, with DBIO, we're actually substantially improving the performance and the capabilities of data mm -hmm. warehousing features. Mm -hmm. We're going to dig into some of those uh, technologies here in a second with George, but have you heard anything here so far from anyone that's changed your mind, maybe about what to focus on next? Um, the so one thing I've heard from uh, a few customers is actually visibility and debuggability of the uh, um, big data jobs. Mm -hmm. So many of them are fairly technical engineers, some of them are less sophisticated engineers and they've written jobs and sometimes the job runs slow. And the, uh, as sort of the performance engineer in me would think, so how do I make the job run fast? But a different way to actually solve that problem is how can we expose the right information so the customer can actually understand and figure it out mm -hmm. themselves this is why my job is slow and this is how I can tweak it to make it faster. And kind of, mm -hmm. um, rather than giving people the fish, you actually give them the tools to fish. Mm -hmm. You can call that buggability. Yeah, debuggability. <laughs> debuggability. And visibility. <laughs> of the, yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, George? Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's go back and unpack some of those kind of juicy areas that you identified. The, um, on deep learning, um, you, were, you were able to distribute, if I understand things right, the the predictions, you yep. could put models out on a cluster, um, but the, the really hard part, the compute intensive stuff was training yep. across exactly. a cluster. And so like deep learning 4J and I think Intel's in, um, big DL, they were written for Spark to, to do that, but yep. with all the excitement over some of the new frameworks, um, are they now at the point where they're good, as good citizens on Spark as they are on their native environments? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. Um, obviously a lot of other frameworks are becoming more and more popular, such as uh, TensorFlow, MXNet, um, Theano, Kiras, and all of this. The, um, 
What the deep learning pipeline library does, it actually makes, exposes all this deep learning, single node deep learning tools that's highly optimized for say even GPUs or CPUs um, to be available as a um, estimator or like a module in the pipeline of the machine learning pipeline library in Spark. So now um, users can actually leverage Spark's capability to for example do hyperparameter tuning. So when you're building a machine learning model, it's, it's fairly rare that you just run something once and you're good with it. You usually have to fiddle with a lot of the parameters. Mm -hmm. For example, you might run over 100 experiments to actually figure out what is the best model I can get. Um, this is where actually Spark really shines when you combine Spark with some deep learning library, be it Big DL, be it MXNet, be it TensorFlow. You could be using Spark to distribute that training and then do cross-validation on it so you can actually find the best model very quickly. And Spark takes care of all the job scheduling, all the fault tolerance properties, and how do you read data in from the different data sources. And without dropping, without my, my dropping too much in the weeds, there was a version of that where Spark wouldn't take care of all the communications. It would like maybe distribute the models and then um, like do some of the averaging of what was done yeah. out on the cluster. But are you saying that all that now can be managed by Spark? So Spark, um, in that library, Spark will be able to actually take care of picking the best model out of it. And there are different ways you can assign um, how, how do you define the best. The best could be okay. some average of some different models. The best could be just pick one out of this. Okay. The best could be maybe this a tree of uh, models that you can classify. Okay. And that's, is, that's a, uh, a hyperparameter configuration choice? Uh, that is, um, or a, an, a so that is actually a built-in functionality in Spark's machine learning pipeline. pipeline. And okay. now what we're doing is now you can actually plug all those deep learning libraries directly into that as part of the pipeline to be used. Okay. Um, um, so another, maybe yeah. just to add, um, yeah. another really cool um, functionality of the deep learning pipeline, transfer learning. So as you said, deep learning takes a very long time. It's very computational demanding and it takes a lot of resources, um, expertise to train. But with transfer learning, what we allow the customers to do is they could take an existing deep learning model as well trained in a different domain, and then we retrain it on a very small amount of data very quickly, oh. and you can adapt it to a different domain. That's like, how sort of the uh, uh, demo on the James Bond car. Right. So there's a gen generic image classifier, but we train it on probably just a few thousand images, and now we can actually detect whether a car is James Bond's car or not. Oh, and the implications there are huge, which is you don't have to have huge tra da training data sets exactly. for mo you know, modifying a similar mo a model of a similar situation. I want to, in the time we have, um, there's always been this, this debate about you know, whether Spark should manage state, you know, whether it's database, key value store, um, tell us the, how the thinking about that has evolved and then um, how the integration interfaces you know, for achieving that have evolved. Yeah, um, so one of the, I would say, um, advantage of Spark is it works with, um, it's unbiased and works with a variety of storage systems, be it Cassandra, be it HBase, be it HDFS, be it S3. Um, it's, um, there is a, I would say, a metadata management um, functionality in Spark, which is the catalog of tables that customers can define, but the actual storage uh, sits somewhere else. And I don't think that will um, change in the near future because we do see that um, the storage systems have matured significantly in the past few years. And uh, I just wrote actually a blog post um, last week about uh, the advantage of S3 over HDFS, for example. The storage price is being driven down by almost a factor of 10x um, when you go to the cloud. And I, I, I just don't think it makes sense at this point to actually build, be building storage systems um, for analytics. That said, I think there's a lot of building on top of existing storage system, there's actually a lot of um, opportunities for optimization on how you can leverage the specific properties of the underlying storage system to get to maximum performance. For example, how do you do in that intelligent caching? How do you start thinking about building indexes um, actually against the data that's stored um, for scan workloads? With tungsten, so you, where you have, you take advantage of the latest hardware and where we get more memory intensive systems, and now that the catalyst optimizer you know, has, has a cost-based uh, optimizer or, or will be, you know, and large memory, can you change how you go about knowing what data you're managing in the underlying system and therefore 
achieve you know, a tremendous uh, acceleration in performance? So this is actually one area we invested in sort of in the DBIO uh, module as part of Databricks runtime. And what DBIO does, um, it, a lot of this are still in progress, but for example, we're adding some form of indexing capabilities to actually the system, so we can quickly skip and prune out all the irrelevant data when the user is doing simple point lookups, or if the user is doing a scan-heavy workload with some predicates. Um, that actually has to do with how we think about the underlying data structure. The storage system is still the same storage system like S3, um, but we're adding actually indexing functionalities on top of it um, as part and, of the other. And, and so what would be the application profiles? Is it, is it just for the analytic queries or you know, can you do the, the point lookups and, and updates in that sort of scenario too? Yeah, so it's interesting you're talking about updates. Updates um, is another thing that we've gotten a lot of feature requests on. Um, we're actively thinking about how we would support update workload. Now, um, that said, I just want to emphasize um, for both use cases of doing point lookups and updates, we're still talking about in the context of analytic environment. So we'll be talking about, for example, maybe bulk updates or low throughput updates rather than um, doing transactional updates in which every time you swipe a credit card, some record gets updated. That's probably more belongs on the, the uh, transactional databases like an Oracle or uh, like MySQL. Um, what about um, when you think about uh, people who are going to run, they started out with Spark on-prem. Yep. They realized they're going to put much more of their resources in the cloud, but with um, IIoT, industrial IoT type applications, they're going to have um, Spark maybe in a gateway server on the edge. Oh. What, what do you think that configuration looks like? Uh, it's really interesting. Um, so it's kind of two questions maybe. The first is the hybrid on-prem cloud uh, solution. So um, again, one of the nice advantage of Spark is decouple of storage and compute. Mm -hmm. So when you want to move, for example, workloads from on-prem to the cloud, um, the one you care the most about is probably actually the data. Because mm -hmm. the compute, um, it doesn't really matter that much where you run it, but data is the one that's hard to move. Um, we do have customers as leveraging um, Databricks in the cloud, but actually reading data directly from on-prem and rely on sort of the caching solution we have that minimize the data transfer over time. And this is kind of one um, route, I would say, it's uh, pretty popular. Um, another one is like, um, with Amazon, you could literally give them this snowball um, <laughs> yeah. functionality. You give them hard drives with trucks, the trucks will ship um, your data directly, put it in S3. Um, the, with IoT, um, what the, a common pattern we see is a lot of the edge devices um, would be actually pushing the uh, data directly into some sort of fire hose like Kinesis or um, Kafka or I'm sure Google and uh, Microsoft both have their own uh, variants of that. And then use Spark to directly subscribe to those topics and process them in real time with structured streaming. And so would Spark be down, let's say, at the, at the site level if not on the device itself? So most, um, it's an interesting thought and maybe one thing we should actually consider more in the future is how do we do push Spark to the edges. Right now it's more of a centralized model in which the devices push data um, into Spark, which is centralized somewhere. I've seen, for example, um, one, uh, I think, I, I don't remember exactly the use case, but it has to do with uh, um, some scientific experiment in the North Pole. And of course there you can, you don't have a great uplink of all the data connecting, transferring back to some, say, national um, lab. And rather, they would do a spark processing there and then ship the aggregated result back. Um, this is another one, but it's less common. All right, well, just one minute now before the break, so I'm going to give you a chance to address the Spark community. What's the next big technical challenge you hope people will work on uh, for the benefit of everybody? Um, I think, in general, um, Spark came along with um, two focuses, one is uh, performance, the other one is ease of use. Mm -hmm. And I still think big data tools are uh, too difficult to use. Um, deep learning tools even harder. The mm -hmm. uh, bar, um, the barrier to entry is very high for all of those tools. Um, I would say um, we, we might have already addressed performance to a degree that I think it's actually um, pretty usable. The systems are fast enough. Mm -hmm. Now um, we should work on actually making sure systems even easier to use. That's what also uh, we focus a lot on at Databricks here. Democratizing access, right? Absolutely. All right, well Reynolds, I wish we could talk to you all day. This is great, we are out of time now. I want to appreciate you coming by theCUBE and, and sharing your insights, and good right. luck with the rest of the show. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Thank you, Reynolds. Thank you all for watching here. We're at theCUBE at Spark Summit 2017. Stay tuned, lots of other great guests coming up today. We'll see you in a few minutes.